So we've been talking uh, pretty sort of conceptually about reputation systems so far in this module, discussing, you know, what are the problems that they fundamentally are meant to solve, problems of asymmetric information like adverse selection and moral hazard. So for this last slide, let's talk a little bit more about sort of how the rubber meets the road. Let's talk about a real reputation system, uh, you know, on a, on a platform that's you know, well known, namely eBay. So eBay, it was founded back in 1995. And... Um, that's pretty much the Stone Age when it comes to internet history. Like, do you know which browser the dominant one was in 1995? Probably not. So uh, Google, let alone Chrome, certainly did not exist in 1995. Um, Firefox didn't exist in 1995. Um, Netscape Navigator had just taken over from the Mosaic browser in 1995. Internet Explorer had just been invented. Moreover, right, so 1995, that's several years before PayPal. So, you know, when buyers and sellers connected on eBay, uh, very often the payment was done via personal check sent through snail mail. So the point of this is, you know, I guess, number one, a lot of things can change in 25 years. Um, but uh, more to the point, 95 was really the Wild West uh, in Internet years. And eBay never would have survived that period if it hadn't paid careful attention to its reputation system. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, its, its reputation system in this final part of this module. The first thing to know about eBay's reputation system, which is different than a lot of the other ones you maybe have seen, is that buyers and sellers rate each other. Okay, so it's not just that buyers rate sellers, sellers can also rate buyers. Maybe you're familiar with this idea more from ride sharing platforms where the drivers actually can rate the riders in addition to vice versa. Whereas if you think about Amazon, you don't have this. So uh, buyers, they can rate sellers, they can rate specific products, but there's no mechanism for sellers to rate buyers. And if you think about the origins of these two companies, actually that sort of makes sense that this is how it worked out. Right, because in eBay, really, the platform just facilitated a matching between the buyers and the sellers, and then the payment would actually occur in the early days off of the platform. So, for example, a buyer could try to buy something by, you know, sending someone a personal check that was later going to bounce. And so it made sense for sellers to rate buyers because buyers could sort of also rip off sellers back in the early eBay days. Right, whereas Amazon, all the payments for stuff goes through Amazon anyways. So if you've got a delinquent buyer, it's much easier for Amazon to just sort of take, take that over and deal with the delinquent buyer directly rather than having the seller worry about it. Now, one thing that's just true about feedback and reputation systems in general, but it's sort of especially extreme in eBay, is that the feedback skews heavily positive. So just to give you a sense on Amazon, right? So this is where the uh, buyers can rate the sellers on transactions, you know, something like 4% of the transactions are rated as unsatisfactory. Uh, whereas on eBay, that number was is less than 1%. Is that because people are a lot happier on eBay than they are on Amazon? Probably not. So eBay did its own sort of internal estimates about what fraction of transactions actually were unsatisfactory. Uh, so for example, they looked, you know, it was their email correspondence between the buyer and the seller, you know, and other kind of red flags for transactions, which indicated they were probably um, unsatisfactory, and they came up with a conservative estimate of you know 3.4 percent of the transactions uh, being not good, worthy of negative feedback, and yet somehow the amount of actual negative feedback was less than one percent. Uh, so what's going on? Why why is the you know negative feedback so much less than on Amazon? Well, things get kind of tricky when you have um, buyers rating sellers and vice versa, as opposed to just buyers rating sellers, as on other marketplaces. Uh, and in particular, one, one basic design decision you need to make when each side is, rate, is rating the other is whether the feedback is going to be uh, given sequentially or simultaneously. So in eBay, the decision has always been to have sequential feedback. So in other words, it happens asynchronously. So whenever either side leaves feedback, that's immediately delivered to the other side. And the issue with sequ sequential feedback is it opens up the door for retaliation. So in particular, you know, if you're a buyer and you're unhappy with the seller and you leave negative feedback for the seller, the seller will find out immediately and they can leave negative feedback back in retaliation on you as a buyer. 
And in fact, unfortunately, retaliation has, you know, in some cases gone well beyond just sort of a, a negative rating. Um, there's been kind of threatening phone calls, you know, various cases in the United States. There's even a defamation lawsuit uh, in the UK. So someone sued someone who left negative feedback claiming that, you know, it was, uh, you know, unduly hurting their business. So this eventually became sort of a big enough problem that eBay did make a change to its reputation system. Uh, interestingly, they kept the sequential aspect of it. I'm not totally sure why, but they kept it sequential. But they did make it so that uh, the sellers could no longer leave negative feedback on the buyers. So the seller, all they could do is basically leave a comment, and then optionally they could leave just sort of a, you know, a thumbs up, a positive feedback. So that decreased the ability of sellers to retaliate against buyers who had rated them negatively. Uh, a different way of doing it would be to go away from sequential feedback and instead use simultaneous feedback. And in fact, Airbnb made exactly this change a few years ago. They had been using sequential and they changed it to simultaneous. So simultaneous is you get some period of time, like say a week after the transaction, uh, where you um, can submit your feedback. And, but the other party does not immediately find out what that feedback is. So basically what happens is once both parties have entered their feedback, at that point, both sets of feedback are released simultaneously. Or if the week expires and only one side left feedback, then at the expiration date, that feedback is given, is given to the other side. And this definitely makes it safer to uh, leave negative feedback because the other side won't even see your negative feedback um, until they've already entered uh, their feedback on you. But even after this tweak to the reputation system, uh, eBay was still getting way too much positive feedback. So they wanted to somehow drill down deeper and get sort of more fine-grained information about whether sellers were good or sellers were bad. And so the second thing they looked into was, you know, let's think about how to summarize the past history of actions of a seller. So for a long time, what eBay was using was a, a very natural measure, uh, which they called the percent positive or PP. So what they did is they just, they looked at say a seller and they looked at all the transactions that the seller had ever uh, been in. And uh, they looked at all of them that had received any feedback at all, okay, positive or negative. Uh, that was the denominator, and then they looked at the fraction of those that were positive. So of, of all the transactions that received some feedback, what fraction of those, for what fraction of those was it positive feedback? That's the PP score. So that's a very natural measure, the PP score. Um, and so, you know, if there's a seller, and I told you that seller had a PP score of, I don't know, 98%, uh, that would probably sound pretty good, right? You know, 98% of the, of the transactions with feedback had positive feedback. Um, but actually... <laughs> If you're on eBay and you see a seller with a PP score of 98%, you should run the other way because they would be in the 10th percentile. Only the worst 10% of the sellers have a PP score of 98% or less. So this just gives you an indication of how positive this feedback uh, is skewing. So the reason PP scores are misleading is that they ignore the transactions where no feedback was given whatsoever. And if you think about it, that's throwing away potentially useful information. Uh, if you see a seller and you see that a really unusual number of their transactions uh, have no feedback whatsoever, that should be a red flag. That should make you wonder if something's going on with the seller. So that suggested a, a very simple tweak, but one that turned out to be pro quite important for eBay, which they made you know, sometime in the last decade, which is in addition to these PP scores, they used what they called EPP scores for effective percent positive. And the only difference is in the denominator, rather than looking only at the transactions that had some kind of feedback, they looked at all of the transactions in which the seller participated, whether feedback was left or not. Unsurprisingly, there was a much bigger spread in sellers' EPP scores than there was in their PP scores. Now, eBay, they didn't actually make the EPP scores visible, um, in part because they weren't confident that buyers would know how to interpret those scores. Um, and also in part because they didn't want sellers to try to, you know, game the measure. Um, eBay did, however, use these sort of more refined EPP scores in their search algorithm. So when you searched for a product, uh, eBay prominently used the EPP scores to figure out the ranking, uh, promoting sellers with a high EPP much more prominently than those with low EPPs. And uh, this seemed like a really good change. So after they did this, um, they observed that a significantly higher fraction of first-time users returned for a second transaction after the search algorithm uh, was changed. So that was a big win. That wraps up this third module where we discussed uh, various forms of asymmetric information and the types of market failures it can cause, including uh, adverse selection, 
uh, and moral hazard. We saw how those pop up in lots of different marketplaces, both sort of traditional ones like health insurance and labor, um, but also in technology platforms like online marketplaces as well. Uh, and now we can recognize reputation systems, you know, which we know and love and sort of, you know, use plenty. We now see, we now have some clarity in our mind about what it is they're actually doing. They're meant to mitigate asymmetric information and the adverse selection and moral hazard problems by exposing information either about the quality of the products being sold and or about the actions that participants in the market uh, are likely to take. Um, and then we also concluded with this final case study of eBay's reputation system and some of the tweaks that they've made to it uh, along the way. Coming up in the next module, we're going to do a deep dive into auctions, specifically the types of auctions for online advertising, uh, which drive almost the entire business model of some of the biggest tech companies, including Google and Facebook. So I'll see you there.